So, this video was originally going to be a response to DigiBurney's second Ghostbusters video, but as I attempted to lay my points out about why I liked the episode, there really wasn't anything I was bringing forward that I hadn't already stated in my Fimpressions video on the episode. I love Digi stuff, but a lot of the times we disagree. And that's okay, because we both look for and respond to very different things in our media, so any further attempts to debunk his claims that Ghostbusters was bad, or try to further explain my point of view, weren't really necessary in my own mind anymore. Different folks and all. The episode isn't that bad, but there is one point Digi mentioned about Ghostbusters that he didn't go into too much detail about. A point that I mentioned, but glossed over as well. A point that probably explains why I'm so defensive about Ghostbusters in the first place. Trixie herself. Both of us agree that Trixie is an awesome character, and we're far from alone in this regard. But there are just as many people who vehemently hate her, and I get asked the question all the time, what makes Trixie so interesting to you that you dedicate five years of your life to making a ten chapter comic book about her? Mind you, most of the time these questions aren't phrased that nicely in clean vulgar language, but you get the idea. The interesting thing about Trixie, and subsequently about Ghostbusters, is that, unlike a lot of my love for other minor characters, my fascination and, at this point I guess you could call it borderline obsession, with Trixie didn't stem from added depth via exposure to fan work. After all, Trixie first appears in Season 1, Episode 6, and I didn't really start digging into fan content until about three or so months ago. But I've been writing the script and developing the storyline for recovery since last April, so where did my fascination for Trixie come from? It came from Ghostbusters alone. Trixie actually had a lot of implied depth and inner conflict in the events of Ghostbusters, and it was that content alone that got me thinking about who this mare actually was, and what had happened to her that had led her to be the pony she is today. I could start going into my headcanon about Trixie's backstory and the like, but that's what recovery is for. Instead, what I want to do here is explain what I was able to gather about Trixie simply from the events of Ghostbusters, and try to explain why I fell in love with the showboating showmare in the first place. Number 1. Aesthetics. This is an obvious one. Trixie was one of the first ponies in the show to have a completely different visual appearance aside from the main six. Early in season one, most of the background ponies simply stood there or moved in basic walk cycles, rarely filling the scene with more than their visual presence. Trixie took things to a whole new level by being one of the first characters besides the main six to have a truly unique physical appearance and actually have some animations to go along with it. In addition, Kathleen Bart's vocal performance perfectly matched her visuals to a T. <laughs> it's true, my enthusiastic little admirers. Trixie just oozed visual uniqueness. And while this was an awesome start, it doesn't really get me all that invested in a character unless there's something else there to back it up. After all, I think Rainbow Shine is one of the coolest designs out of all the ponies, but I forget about her 9 times out of 10 because she doesn't do anything. Luckily for Trixie, she does have some depth to fall back on. What is that, you might ask? Well, let's take a look. Reason number 2. Character Foil. Or, to put it another way, Trixie is the Green Ranger. Allow me to explain. Up until this point in the series, the antagonists of Friendship is Magic were always something different than the main six. In the opener, they faced Nightmare Moon, an ascended being. In the last episode before this one, Griffin the Brush Off, Pinkie Pie goes up against Gilda, who is not a pony, but a griffin. And then in the other episodes so far in the series at this point, the antagonists had just been one of the members of the main six dealing with slice of life problems. Enter Trixie. Unlike the other antagonists the series had produced thus far, Trixie is a pony, just like the main cast. And as a result, she's not only an antagonist, but a foil to them, specifically to Twilight in the context of this episode. While Twilight is shown to be rather uncomfortable showcasing her abilities, Trixie is a showboat and has no qualms with proclaiming her own greatness, regardless of those claims' validity. The fact that she then proceeds to shut down the majority of the main cast portrays Trixie as someone with at least some level of aptitude. And this moment carries a lot more weight when you realize that the first creature to give the main six significant pause isn't a demigod, or a monster, but another pony, just like them. Sure, Trixie might be a total jerk, but that's still kinda badass. And who else is badass like this? Able to take on an entire group of protagonists by themselves and, after being able to overcome dozens of monsters, were totally beaten by someone the same as themselves? Who else becomes evil under the control of an ancient artifact that twists their personality and eventually is saved by the main character, and after an almost out of character 180 and instant forgiveness is seen in a positive light by the main cast? See? Green Ranger. Number 3. Implication of Depth. As I've stated many times now, the primary aspect of characterization that gets me interested in a character is the presentation of depth. Essentially, the more there is to a character, the more interested I become. This is one of the biggest reasons why Rarity is my favorite of the main six. She has tons of dimension. 
So how could a character like Trixie have any actual depth to her just based on her appearances in Ghostbusters? She bombed in, caused some shit, and left. What more to her is there than that? Well, the way the episode presents her, it kind of implies that there's a lot going on with Trixie. And this is something I mentioned a bit in my Ghostbusters for Impressions video, but the scene that made me really start taking an interest in Trixie comes at about 16 minutes into the episode, when she drops the third person nomenclature she's been using for the entire episode thus far. At this point, what was initially displayed as a stereotypical verbal tick for someone who has an insane ego instantly transformed from something habitual to a conscious decision, because once her confidence and control of the situation wane, Trixie immediately stops putting on airs and panics, showing us that referring to herself in the third person is an act, not a habit. This implies a ton, because this doesn't just mean that the third person referentials were forced, it means her entire persona as presented thus far has been a farce. To which the obvious rebuttal would be, well, no duh, she's a stage performer, she has an onstage persona. But it's shown throughout the episode that even when she isn't performing, she still keeps the act up. Even when woken up in the middle of the night, she still immediately reverts to the great and powerful Trixie. To which one would probably make the case that she's just trying to keep the character alive when interacting with the public. But if we look ahead to Magic Duel, even when she's in Ponyville on a personal vendetta, she still keeps this image alive. So, Trixie's third-person referentials and egomaniacal airs aren't a stage persona, but just a persona. She's faking who she really is. Why? Who knows? And that's the brilliance of it. This one slip-up in personal pronouns implies tons of depth to this character. What kind of things could have happened to this mare that made her have to put on this mask in her everyday life, shielding her from who she really is to everyone else? Trixie in this brief moment, transforms from a flat antagonist to a character with a huge amount of potential emotional baggage. How you interpret that is up to you, but at this point in my own mind, the storyteller gears began to turn and the initial ideas for recovery were born. And finally, arguably the biggest reason. The reason I think myself, and many like me, love Trixie so much. Number four, redemption, or a lack thereof. So, this point has kind of been weakened a bit now that Magic Duel air quotes redeemed and air quotes Trixie, but again, I'm trying to communicate why I fell in love with Trixie initially, so all of this needs to be filtered through a lens pre-Magic Duel. Anyways, redemption. Trixie didn't get redeemed at the end of Ghostbusters. She didn't learn her lesson. She just gets shown up and takes off, seemingly learning nothing. Now, I can't speak for the entire fandom, but for me personally, I can guarantee you that if Trixie was redeemed at the end of Ghostbusters, I would not be making recovery. Because her arc would have ended there. Yeah, the fact that there was a lot of implied depth to her was interesting, and it certainly would have been something I'd continue to think about, but I wouldn't be going so far out of my way to tell a story like I am with recovery, and by extension, probably wouldn't be as invested in Trixie as a character. The fact that Trixie doesn't get redeemed though means that Ghostbusters, in terms of Trixie's character, isn't a complete story. Rather, it's the beginning of a character redemption arc. We see this kind of setup all the time in literature. Some great modern examples of this format are the first Iron Man film and The Emperor's New Groove. In both of these films, the protagonist is initially portrayed as having some semblance of success. Tony Stark being a super genius multi-billionaire, and Emperor Cusco being, well, the Emperor. However, despite having a sense of charm to them, the lead character still comes off as someone who isn't really worthy of the success they're currently enjoying and this aspect rubs the viewer the wrong way. Then, there is an event that causes the protagonist to fall from grace and lose whatever momentum, status, or success they were enjoying despite themselves. In the case of Tony Stark, it's being captured by the terrorist group and getting the shrapnel caught in his chest. For Cusco, it's becoming a llama. This is the point where the characters are at their lowest, and the rest of the narrative follows their trials and tribulations as they attempt to get over these obstacles and build themselves back up to their former glory usually growing and coming to a new conclusion of some kind that they previously lacked that redeems their character in the eyes of the audience and alleviates that point of contention with the character that the viewer had in the beginning. For Tony, this is creating the Iron Man armor and bowing out of the weapons industry, vowing to apply his talents to a more constructive application. For Cusco, he learns from Pacha to become less of an arrogant self-centered dick and think of the concerns of others and not just himself. This entire arc fits beautifully within the events of both Ghostbusters when looking at the episode from Trixie's perspective. Trixie is a successful showmare, going from town to town, astounding and amazing with denizens with feats of magic and half-truths. However, we as an audience can tell that her arrogant nature and penchant to bend the truth kind of rubs our general sense of morality the wrong way, despite her strong stage presence and charisma. Enter Twilight being able to handle the Ursa Minor after Trixie's failure, and she's outed in public as a fraud. This is her fall from grace as she loses all credibility, the crux of her fame shown to be a sham. And then the episode ends.
From Trixie's standpoint, we are right at the cusp of beginning to delve into her character arc. Learn more about her, begin to understand her motivations, become invested in her plight as she attempts to dig herself out of this pit she's essentially dug for herself with all of her lies. Trixie is right at the start of a character-driven narrative when the episode ends. And this is why I think so many people in the community write about Trixie, or are at least so fascinated by her. Ghostbusters whet our appetite for learning more about this character by making her visually appealing, implying some underlying baggage to her motivations, and began her down the path of a character-driven narrative. But just when all the pieces were beginning to come together and start bearing some fruit about who she really was, were interrupted by the ending credits. And this is also why, despite enjoying Magic Duel so much, I got so bent out of shape over the last minute redemption, because we never got to be privy to any of this journey, nor does Magic Duel even imply that this growth happened at all off screen. The apology at the end of Magic Duel felt so weak because it probably should have happened at the end of Ghostbusters, ending the character's journey right there, albeit prematurely. By giving the community nearly two years to reflect on who Trixie is and have this ambiguity make her that much more embedded in our minds, the sudden 180 and forced apology in Magic Duel just seemed anticlimactic given the events weight that the Trixie Twilight rivalry has been given, both in the context of the universe as Trixie has been shown in Magic Duel to become obsessed over besting her, and to us as viewers as this relationship has been the cornerstone of her fan and persona ever since Ghostbusters aired. But hey, development like that's the reason projects like Recovery exist, am I right? Eh? 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 Okay, I'll shut up now. Later, he gets the rebound, passes it to the man, shoots it, and boom goes the dynamite. Okay, great. Thanks a lot for that look in the sports, Brian. Yeah.